Howdy, folks. If you're thinking of getting into wedding photography or even if you're just shooting the occasional wedding, today we're getting into the gear. You need to create incredible images for your couples. And we'll discuss how to get wedding clients to choose you over the competition right after this. Welcome to Camera Shake, where we bring you the insider scoop on all things photography and videography, giving you a unique opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. As always, I'm your host, Kirsten Nutz, and before we get into it, I've got one thing to ask of you. I've noticed that over 65% of our viewers on YouTube and listeners on audio are not actually subscribed to this channel. Well, you can really help us out by hitting that subscribe button, because it'll help us get even more amazing guests on the show in the future. It's just one click. It'll take a mere second. Thank you so much. Just click that, you know, click that, click that button. Just right now. There. It's easy, right? Just uh, subscribe, follow, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> anyway, now without further ado, let's give it up for today's special guest, the doggo and cattle loving Scotch aficionado from Down Under, the wedding expert, photographer, and a man who shares his Dutch heritage with myself. Give it up for Marcel van der Horst. Marcel, man, how are things? Great. Thanks for having me. Uh, very excited to be here. Thank you so much for coming coming on the show. Uh, I mentioned the, the Dutch heritage. Uh, because my, so I have a Dutch line in my family too. Um, it's my grandmother's side of, side of the family uh, were Dutch. So, you know, always great to connect. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, my family moved here from Australia over 50 years ago now. So a little bit uh, disconnected now, but uh, they come from Vassana and Kathvik. So... Um, I don't know the country well I'll, and love it. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So my grandmother's side were from Fenlo, um, just on the, well, close to the German border, I guess. Ah, oh, yep. yeah. Yeah. We're the opposite side on the, on the West coast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I just drove through the Netherlands actually, um, in August. So yeah, it was a, this a nice trip just on the way through, but it was fun. All right, yeah, so cool. Marcel, thank you so much for uh, for being on the show. Um, it's it, I think we've got some interesting topics to cover um, this week, and um, we're going to talk about wedding photography, but we're going to very specifically uh, talk about wedding photography in the context of maybe you know if if there's somebody out there who uh, either maybe just started shooting weddings or is maybe thinking about joining the wedding game um, and shooting weddings. So you know if if you're listening. Or if you're watching and uh, maybe you're, I don't know, you're shooting family portraits at the moment, you're thinking, oh, maybe maybe weddings might be a good idea. Um, so we're going to basically jump right in. We're going to talk about gear and we're also going to talk about, well, so if you decide weddings is the thing you want to do, like how do you get started and how do you find clients? How does all of this work? Um, so Marcel, um, I'm, you know, I'm banking on your expertise. <laughs> sure, no. ask away. Um, I'm happy to expand on uh, anything. And uh, I've been in this trade for 16 years now, and I've been through probably every iteration of photography equipment you can imagine. And you know, the journey from crop sensor, 10 megapixel cameras to the, the latest and greatest, that's on offer now. And, you know, we're talking about gear, but really, you know, when I look at wedding photographers, this is, um, I have. Um, it really, the the utmost respect for a great wedding photography. I think it's amazing, especially, you know, I mean, creating these sort of moments or capturing these moments and creating these images under the pressure that you're under during the actual wedding because it's such a, like, finely timed procedure the whole day, really. You know, and you get to, like, you get to create uh, these amazing images or you're able to create these amazing images. I mean, your photography is so, uh, it's actually uh, like, so cinematic almost, you know, um, and, you know, the ability to create photography like that under that kind of time pressure, how do you prepare for that? And what specific equipment makes your life easier or makes that possible in the first place? Let's start with cameras, for example. Like, how does that work? Yeah, so uh, with cameras, I have two camera bodies pretty much on my person all day. So I'll have one with a wide lens on it and one with sort of either a medium telephoto or long telephoto. So that way uh, I'm at the ready for a different situation at any one time because I'm a prime lens shooter. So 
Um, I don't have the luxury of having one body, one broad zoom uh, range, and then just be able to select whatever focal length that tells the story and shoot. I have, yeah, a wide and a, and a tight on at all times. So I can have that cinematic approach where I can take an environmental photo of the scene that's presented in front of me, say with a 24 mil or a 35 mil, but I also have a 50 or an 85 mounted as well to get those reaction shots and, you know, tighter in the, the character, uh, that, you know, maybe the bride getting ready or something like that, or, um, a groom having his lapel flower pinned on by his father, that sort of thing. So, um, the, the bodies themselves, uh, have to be, uh, quite good and quite fast and quite responsive with good autofocus because, uh, there are instances where things unfold in front of you, you have to be quite reactive to it. And if you have, you know, gear that's complex, cumbersome, difficult to use, um, and doesn't focus well, um, you're not going to tell that story properly. Now, here'd be a question here for somebody uh, coming from, um, let's say an events background, right? So if you're an events shooter, uh, you know, one of your standard lenses would be a 24 to 70 for example or maybe a 24 to 120 something like that um what's the advantage of of using primes or having two bodies with two different primes over something let's say you know like a 24 to 120 something that gives you that range what's the advantage of having two separate prime lenses there so in the event space um a 2470 f2.8 or f4 is quite the staple um, because you're often using an on-camera flash at the same time but my approach when it comes to photography, I like to single out the subject from the background. So I use primes that have um, two reasons. There's the the fast aperture to allow me to shoot in darker conditions without flash. So that might be, um, say, a, a bedroom or a hotel where a couple might be getting ready. And I can shoot at apertures like f1.8 or 1.4 even 1.2 if I really need to go that far um, and then also yeah to single out the uh, subject from the background um, is another reason why um, I use fast aperture lenses and it sort of I feel it elevates the photography a little bit more where you can really get invested in the character when the viewer is looking at the the subject in frame um, you know it's it makes the background fall off a little bit softly and it just gives gives it a nicer look. That That's my main reason why I've, I've gone that approach. And it, when it comes to primes, for instance, as a portrait photographer, um, you know, I, I love primes. Obviously, I use primes all the time, especially 85 is my go-to lens for loads of things that I do. Um, but for somebody just starting out, would you say, um, I mean, let's say, um, you know, if you're looking at a prime like a 1.8 over a 1.4, because the, the price difference is quite dramatic between those two lenses. Would you say that to start out, when you're first starting out shooting weddings, like a, a 1.8 would do the trick? Or would you advise to actually bite the bullet and spend the money <laughs> on a 1.8? Yeah, um, all, all photographers will suffer this in their lifetime. And, um, and, and that's gear acquisition syndrome. So if you do start with a F1.8, Yes, you will be able to do your job. You will be able to sustain a business with that lens and you'll be able to create imagery just as good as someone else that might have an F1.2. But you will find you will lust for that lens down the line. So if you're spending, say, 700 US on, say, an F1.8 Prime, and then you get maybe two years out of it, you may have to sell that off for four or 500. And then you're going to put that four or 500 into a lens that's going to cost you, say, $2,000. And, you know, you could have maybe have spent that 2000 in the first place and not have lost four or $500 in that process. So uh, if I was to start from scratch, my advice would be is to invest in the best quality gear that you can up front. So that way you get more of a life out of it because once you go to pro quality equipment, it's pretty much designed to work in the professional space and also last you a very, very long time. And so it's it's really all about future proofing ultimately if you can afford it from the Yeah, absolutely. And 
It's always hard when you're starting out. Um, you know, you get money in from a, a job and then you go, okay, I need to buy that lens. And then you invest in it and it, it just becomes like a sort of a, a system that just rolls uh, over time and you start picking up all these little bits and pieces of things that you do think you need. And then uh, as you get older and more established, you, you find yourself just needing less and less, but you do need that sort of robust quality. And if you want an elevated kind of work, um, especially in the higher price space, yeah, to have the the nicer lenses is is really good to have and it'll enable you to shoot in lower light conditions and get that subject standing out in the frame a bit more. And I think you can, you know, charge more money down the line as well as a result. I can I can absolutely um yeah, I can totally agree with that. It's I've I really have made that, that mistake many times where just, you know, especially when I first started out, I was like, oh, okay, I'll buy this thing. But this thing is much cheaper than that thing. Like, I don't know, a C-stand, right? I'll I'll spend a little bit of money on this cheaper C-stand because what's the difference? Um, and I did realize about nine months later, <laughs> the difference was when I had to spend the same money again to get another C-stand, you know. And, uh, you know, especially with lighting, I find it's, it's, it's nuts how much money you can drop on stuff like that. Yeah, I've felt the same way when it comes to things, even as simple as accessories like like light stands. Because when you're in the heat of the moment and, you know, I also dabble in the commercial space as well, to have those um, bits of equipment that fails you on the job, um, yeah, the cheap stuff is not going to last. Um, you see a lot of these uh, Amazon sort of white label brands that are coming up in terms of um, accessories and they're just not built to sustain professional use. And you find yourself replacing it down the line. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, again, so many times I've done this. Uh, in terms of lenses, I mean, you know, I I was in a lucky position that I could invest some money into um, Pro Glass really right from the from the beginning, more or less. And I have to say, I mean, I didn't buy them new. Actually, I bought them secondhand. Um, but these lenses, I'm still shooting them like for... Where are we now, sir? 13 years later, I'm still shooting the same glass. It's probably time for an upgrade, really, but, but you know, they still work. And to be honest, that, that glass, uh, you know, that, that Nikon glass, you can drive a tank over these lenses, you know, and they'll still... Well, in fact, in many situations, that would have actually happened, you know? But, yeah, <laughs> they're really, like, uh, like indestructible, pretty much, you know? Um, also very heavy, but, you know. So let's say you've, you know, you've invested into... Decent pro glass. Uh, we've got some decent camera bodies, and you mentioned it earlier. Autofocus is is really super important in the wedding game because there's really nothing worse than missing that, you know, that shot, like the first kiss or that kind of stuff. Um, what would be your advice on like camera bodies in particular? Yeah, to the, at the end of the day, pretty much you can't buy a bad camera uh, in this current sort of state. Uh, generally most um, bodies that you can get sort of in the prosumer range um, and that might be sort of the two to four thousand US dollar range uh, will suffice for uh, wedding photography and when you shoot as much as I do you find yourself you will be changing that body over probably every three or four years because you will get to a point where you've fired so many frames through it it's eventually going to potentially uh you know a shutter blind might fail or you know the sensor might die uh so you need to change it um down the line so um there are you know really high-end top bodies but i've found the sort of middle ground when it comes to uh the body selection is being more than enough uh for my use uh, and ones that have good video features in built now are becoming uh less and less in price so yeah i I don't think it's a lot of sense to maybe spend ten thousand or eight thousand on a on a camera body when you got have to change them over every three or four years. So, um, yeah, I do find the uh, in my case, I use the Sony A seven fours, which have been more than robust enough for professional use. And previous to that, the A seven threes, and yeah, it still produced a very good uh, image. The A seven three, their video quality is not as good as the A seven four, but uh, in a photo sense, very, very similar. That's actually, you mentioned video there. I mean, that's, that's an interesting thing because um, it, obviously with 
the vast majority of you know mirrorless cameras nowadays, and you know whether it's Canons or Sony's, um, the, or even Nikon, you know the the video abilities of of those cameras has improved dramatically over the last four or five. I mean, really dramatically. Um, do you how much do you use those video features when you're shooting a wedding? Like, so what I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, are you moving towards like is it almost like being a hybrid shooter at a wedding or do you do you still have a dedicated videographer um on the job yeah so the way i've biz- um set up my business i've primarily been a photographer and i have been all my career and um it was pretty much in around 2019 where the demand for combination photo and video businesses uh, rapidly increased uh, in this country and um, I had a videographer friend uh, that did some work for me and uh, he was quite green in the industry, but I said, do you want to jump on board with me and start shooting video with me? And as a sort of a one-two punch combination of photo and video together for a wedding, uh, that slowly increased in popularity. Of course, uh, COVID in 2020 and 2021 was a big problem here in Melbourne. Um, we had the longest lockdowns in the world, so that put like almost a two year hiatus, uh, on the business. Um, but as soon as we came back from that, um, it was, uh, super busy and, um, having that offering increase the revenue of the business substantially because I would, uh, bring in this videographer as a contractor and then, uh, I would provide a full service, uh, to the client. And, um, yeah, to answer your question, yeah, I did outsource the video side of things, but I also found myself offering video that sometimes there is a quest, uh, request for me to shoot video as well. So there are times that I might, um, be behind the camera for the purpose of video. Um, but pretty much 99% of the time I am the photographer. Um, and yeah, I don't do the, the hybrid thing because, uh, I feel like I need to be hundred percent sort of dialed into photography personally. Uh, there are some great up and coming photographers now that are, are doing that sort of approach. Um, but I'm an all in <laughs> kind of guy when it comes to the photography. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really difficult, especially on the same job to switch back and forth. That's, that's why I find, you know, I do, I do some video, um, but I, I just find purely from a headspace point of view, it's, it's either, you know, either you all in with the stills or you all in with the video, you know, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a constant, the constant back and forth would do my head in to be honest with you. Yeah. And the franticness of a, of a wedding, I, I think doesn't really lend itself to applying yourself uh, to do a good enough job in both spaces at the same time. Uh, I really do think, uh, especially when you get to your higher pricing levels is you want to be really attentive uh, to what's going on in front of you so that way you're at the ready at all times to capture those moments that some of them don't repeat yeah well this is exactly it um, and you know I'm often asked like what's your like what is your nightmare scenario in, ph- in photography and I always think my absolute utter complete and utter nightmare would be having to shoot a wedding on film like personally <laughs> you know it's this thing like where like somebody asked like did you did you get the first kiss and you go uh I think so. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> did you get the first dance? Um, I hope so. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I, no, right? I have to wait and yeah. see you know, when we get it back from the lab. Or, you know. Yeah, having um, grown up on film uh, through the 90s, yeah, I, I totally understand that. So I understand the approach to film and what's involved. And, yeah, I would not shoot a wedding in this day and age. There are people that offer that alongside their digital services. But, um yeah, it's it's more buzzword and sort of trendy um, than it is uh, to deliver a whole wedding uh, on film these days. It's yeah, I mean, you can emulate it in post anyway. It's a very interesting conversation I had with Jerry uh, Bionis at one point. He told me that he um, just just for fun and to switch things up, he went out and he shot a whole wedding on Polaroid. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> respect. <laughs> Risky, but hey, <laughs> okay, you know. But yeah, oh, maybe that's what I'm going to do. Fuji Instax. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> Who's getting married next? <laughs> that's what yeah, I would know. If anyone's going to do it, uh, Jerry's the guy to do it. Um, yeah, like, we, like we, I mentioned before uh, we started here today, 
uh, yeah, he's been one of my greatest inspirations when it comes to wedding photography. And um, my first mentorship was with him. And a lot of the lessons I learned, even all those years ago, I think it was like 13 years ago now, um, I still apply to this day. Fantastic. Yeah, Jerry's uh, just a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, wedding photographer. It's very interesting, um, of course, having a, having him on the show uh, in the past. And um, if I remember what the episode number was I will mention it. Otherwise, I'll put it there. If you're watching on YouTube, it'll be somewhere up there, wherever that goes. <laughs> and, and also a big inspiration for me was uh, one of your previous guests, uh, Joe McNally as well. And yeah. his approach to lighting and story was uh, amazing. And yeah, I use some of those lessons I learned through his books um, in my photography today. Yeah. And, you know, storytelling is, is actually, that's a really um, important aspect. And well, let's, let's talk about that a little bit because, you know, you're telling a really important story for, for a lot of people the most important story of their life potentially you know that that one day the most important day of their life and uh well you can't really screw that up so how much preparation goes into that beforehand and, and i mean i don't I i'm talking to somebody who shot over 700 weddings so I, you probably do this like in your sleep but how much actual prep goes into that um into that day and are there massive differences between different weddings or do they pretty much all sort of unfold in the same way in your experience? Um, I'm finding these days uh, types of weddings and uh, approaches to weddings is becoming vastly different now. Um, a lot of traditions are sort of going out the window, which is totally fine. I love to see the fresh approach to weddings you know some people are ditching the the very typical things that are expected at a wedding so um it's up to me to sort of capture those differences as well that make this couple unique um part of my approach is to really find what drives them um in terms of their love for each other and their passion for each other and i try to work with their, either their venue or location shoot, something that's uh, going to really connect with them themselves as well. So that way, when they look back on these photos, the, the photos make sense and uh, they connected to them as well. That day in, in everybody's life, if you go back, if you, well, if you're listening into you have been married or you are married, have been married. <laughs> if you are married, if you did get married at one point, uh, then I'm sure you understand how important that is. Now, you know, I, I remember a story from my own wedding, which I'm sure I've told on the podcast several times, but, um, you know, when uh, I got married seven years ago and it was summer as well. So the idea was, oh, it'd be great. You know, hopefully fingers crossed the weather would be good. And, you know, uh, but our wedding day, um, in August of 2017 was the wettest August day in 45 years. Yeah. And I had that exact scenario actually, uh, not long ago. Uh, so it's summer here in Melbourne and typically at this time of year when people set uh, their wedding in a winery, uh, they kind of expect it to be warm and beautiful and have gorgeous sunsets. But I had a recent occasion where and it was unforecast. It, it just appeared out of nowhere, really. It rained all day and part of being a photographer is you have to adapt and you are hired for to produce something magical for that couple and we didn't have a, a sunset to speak of so I had to adapt and create something that's special to them and I always tell myself I need to come away from every wedding with what's called a wall worthy image which is an image that I feel is like almost like a hero image of the day or something that might be worth printing big to put on your wall at home and I don't necessarily mean the very typical just two people looking at the camera type of thing I look for something that's quite artful uh, that might be small in the frame is often the case but uh, something that really is um, yeah very highly curated in terms of the approach so um, what I decided to do was um Due to my experience, I have in my camera kit some um, plastic bags with bungee cords that I can put over my lights. So I have a video light and also a flash that I took outside in the rain. I had them bagged so I can leave them out in the rain 
and I had someone come out with me that had an umbrella over me to mostly protect my cameras more than anything else. And the couple were under umbrellas and created this um, you know, amazing shot that they uh, mentioned in both their review and also just a, uh, an email to say, thank you for everything. We absolutely love that photo because it, it was something that didn't, they did not expect and yeah, created something exciting for them. And, um, they got, you know, somewhat quite drenched <laughs> in the process, but, uh, and so did I, but, uh, yeah, we come away with something really special and, and they love it for that. That's, that's really, I think that's really the trickiest way to create something that's really unique, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's interesting what you said, um, a minute ago was that, you know, a lot of people are throwing these traditions out the window, which, you know, at first, at first, my, my first thought was like, oh no, that's going to be difficult. But then I thought, well, actually that gives you a lot of opportunity to create unique imagery. Yeah. Timelines are, um, they're often quite compact and quite tight, but, um, I'm finding people are ditching a lot of the formalities at receptions to focus more on the party. And uh, my job as a photographer is to uh, really show that excitement in the crowd and them dancing away and having fun. Uh, they're the photos that are quite valuable uh, to clients, I think, rather than, you know, the really traditional stuff like cutting the cake, for example. Uh, that's just happening less and less. And, and um, I connect with my clients uh, many times in the lead up to their wedding. So not only during the the process of onboarding them as a client, where I might ask about their journey uh, leading up to the point of being engaged or, or planning their wedding, uh, but also I'll get to know them a little bit more in the lead up to the wedding as well to see what's valuable to them, what is the, you know, the things I really need to capture, um, you know, and also get an indication of, um, what excites them in terms of photography as well. They even linked to me some previous samples of work that I might've done. So that way I can really make sure I deliver a product that is exactly what they envision and dream of. Hey, let me just jump in real quick to tell you about the amazing sponsor of this episode, Platypod. Platypod offers innovative camera support systems designed to unleash your creativity. With their stable, versatile, and portable solutions, you can capture stunning shots like never before. And I'm not just saying that. As the host of the Camera Shake podcast, I can personally vouch for Platypod's incredible products. They've become an integral part of the show. In fact, I'm surrounded by various Platypod products holding up lights, cameras, microphones, and so on. It's really helped to transform the way I make the show and the way I shoot at home, in the studio, and on location. But don't just take my word for it. Explore Platypod's website at www.platypod.com to discover their range of products, including the Platypod Extreme, Platyball Tripod Heads, and the brand new handle, of course. Make sure to follow Platypod on Instagram and Facebook at Platypod Tripods for exclusive updates, tips, and giveaways. By choosing Platypod, you're not only investing in your photography, but you're also supporting the Camera Shake Photography Podcast. Thanks again to Platypod, our amazing sponsor. Platypod, where innovation never sleeps. Because I was wondering about how much, you know, how much preparation goes into it. So even before the shoot, um, what's a typical process? Like, how do you do you have, um, so, uh, you know, consultation meetings beforehand, leading up to the actual uh, to the actual wedding day, and and how much do you plan that day out? Like, do you know literally minute by minute what's going to happen on that day? Yeah, I'm a very detail-focused person, so I will um, not only ask her a lot of questions um, ab about who they are at the start of the transaction, but leading up to the wedding, I'll send them a very detailed questionnaire that will uh, have them map out exactly what's happening through the day, uh, such as ceremony time, reception time, that sort of thing, and that enables me to create a timeline and if there's anything outside of that questionnaire that I don't understand or need more information on, I will reach out to them specifically and find out because uh, I want to make sure that on the day I have this run sheet and I can refer to it quite easily because I've put it into a format that I can at a glance um, see what's going on. So that way they don't have to think about anything themselves. So I will pretty much run the day in terms of time 
um, without being militant about it, but I make sure that they're ready on time, that the dress is on at a certain time, the suits are buttoned up at a certain time. So that way the day can be paced adequately, keeps the stress levels lower, and they don't have to worry about anything and they just have to enjoy it. That That's the, the main purpose uh, of getting across all the details before the actual wedding day itself. How often do things actually go 100% according to plan and, and, and sort of move smoothly without a hitch? <laughs> how, how often does it actually happen? <laughs> it's actually pretty rare to be running perfectly on time. Um, I have found myself more and more as time goes on the more I connect with the clients beforehand and also sometimes other vendors like celebrants and videographers, um, things are yeah pacing themselves quite well. Um, I generally find couples that have bigger wedding parties, they try to jam in too many uh, formalities, uh, too many events into one little space that the day gets overly complicated and once one thing runs behind, the whole day runs behind. So the simpler sort of weddings that are a bit more sort of grounded, um, they will run to time more than they will uh, have the more complex, bigger events. What's the most complex wedding you've ever shot? Um, this was a contract job for another business that was based in a different state, but um, I had a, um, a couple that spent, um, this is just on flowers and candles at the reception alone about eighty thousand dollars uh, eighty thousand australian dollars which is uh mind-boggling to some people people will spend that entire uh you know wedding uh that amount and then some and there was yeah supercars uh delivering the groomsmen to the church and uh there was four or five groomsmen and uh four or five uh bridesmaids as well and yeah it was a big day um and yeah there's just so many things going on there was bands there was djs there was singers and all sorts of things so um it was a quite a long event uh as well and i find um i've had some weddings that have gone as long as uh 19 hours uh the coverage right from the uh, morning to early hours of the evening um and almost non-stop too um, just simply because there was just so much dancing and things going on and people involved. Uh, yeah, it was quite the day. <laughs> I said, typically, how much of the day do you, do you cover? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm guessing, you know, you probably start with the bride getting ready, I suppose. And then do you, like, do you finish off when the dancing starts? Because then, well, there's dancing for the rest of the night. It's gonna, you know, or, or how long do you normally go on for? Probably about 80 or so percent of my wedding coverages are eight hours in length. So I'd often spend uh, generally about 45 minutes with the guys getting ready. If it's a, a typical sort of um, male, female um, type of um, wedding. Um, I find with the same sex weddings, the, uh, the getting ready portion is a lot shorter um, because I don't put a lot of emphasis on that part of the, of the day. And they often get ready together in a lot of cases. And then you would spend an hour or so with the girls getting ready. There's about a half hour window, typically before the ceremony itself. Uh, ceremonies in Australia are quite short. Um, the actual legal part only takes about five or six, five or six minutes, but the typical ceremony length is about 25 minutes and then 15 or so for family photos, an hour or so for their photographic session which you know if it's at a winery it's just a stroll through the grounds of the property and then up to the end of the formalities is the most common sort of coverage um, formalities being things like speeches cake cart first dance amazing cool okay and then i'm, I'm guessing if somebody wants you to stay longer you, they can just purchase that as an add-on i guess yeah, um, it's not uncommon for them to request extra hours after the initial booking because once they've mapped out their timeline, they're going, hmm, I've spent a lot of money on the band and and the DJ, so I might want to cover that sort of thing. Um, there are occasions where couples might want to have 
a sparkler exit or some kind of ceremony on on the end of the night uh even fireworks to some degree i've seen as well so they might want to have those special events captured and they will add on extra time so we talked about um some of the some of the gear required in terms of like lenses and um and, and mm-hmm. camera bodies um i want to get a little bit into into lighting as well just mainly because i mean personal interest you know i'm a portrait photographer i use lights all that i love lighting yep. and that's that's what i do but um uh you mentioned earlier the obviously the advantage in shooting primes is that you can you know you get better results in low light situations obviously because you got wider apertures and so on um and but how much artificial lighting do you use um, and, and under what circumstances and or are there particular specific circumstances where you would basically light, you know, light with strobes, for example, or how, the, how yeah. does that work at a typical wedding? Yeah, so um, I do have um, a lot of lighting that I do take with me to a wedding. Um, you'll find, you know, um, you know, younger photographers, uh, if you're listening, the a lot of photography is uh, or equipment is just in case. Um, you know, with weddings, you do need to have backups of some of your equipment. Um, I've got most focal lengths covered. I've got two camera bodies. Uh, I do have some extra equipment at home as a just in case thing as well. If something were to break outside of the wedding or before it, I do have some other zoom lenses available at my disposal that I have purchased over the years and, um, and also lighting as well. Um, and, you know, you can start off with as simple as just a, a speed light. And like I've just got a, you know, Godox uh, V1S is a, a very typical um, way of getting extra light where you need it because not every situation you're going to sh- shoot uh, without a flash because some venues are just too dark um, to capture any kind of photography. So having an on-camera speed light is the, probably the first step. I'd approach with um, purchasing lighting gear. Um, But I will go to the extent in a lot of occasions to try to get my lighting off camera because it's generally more flattering. Um, It's it's more, you know, it's probably different to what you would normally get with an on-camera speed light as well. So I have um, via radio trigger, sometimes flashes remotely located around the reception, especially around the dance floor. Um, and because I've been working with a lot of videographers lately, I've um, started um, bringing on constant lighting as well. So that way that can be utilized alongside video teams as well. So there's no need to have multiple light stands dotted around the reception, which, uh, you know, when you mix drunk people in becomes a hazard. And uh, it's just more stuff to bring. Um, but yeah, with uh, constant lighting, I find that's enough power to, uh, you know, lift those um, points where there might be a couple on the dance floor, the lights are on them, and I can expose for the highlights, wait for them to be in the right position at the right time, and then. I really sort of be really concentrated on, okay, this is the shot where I'm going to get the best composition, where the the lighting lights up their faces as best as possible, and that's when I'll click the shutter. And when I say constant lighting, um, I just um, bought myself a one of the new small rig RC60Bs, um, which has been awesome. It's got an inbuilt battery, and I just pop that in the corner of the room, um, 60 watts of power, and... Uh, variable color temperature as well and so I can dial that into the uh, the lighting that matches the room and um, videographers love me because I don't have flashes popping off all the time and uh, yeah it just works hand in hand and yeah um, becomes a little bit of a dance uh, when I'm working with videographers but uh, they do appreciate the uh, uh, the constant light for sure that's that's what I like about the small rig gear. Um, I'm using a, a 120D just here right now, um, and uh, it, although it's not battery powered, but with a 60D, it's just, that's, that's just such an advantage. The fact that you don't have to plug them in anywhere, and you can just literally plonk them anywhere where you think you know uh, they might be, they might be good, and you don't have to worry about power lines and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
you know, and again, in a situation where you have a lot of people getting more and more, what's the word, inebriated, inebriated, yeah. whatever the word is. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might be, it might be tricky to have like cables going across the floor. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, heavy uh, light stands as well. So uh, you want to avoid that where you can. Uh, that light is small enough to you know, even use like a super clamp or something on a, you know, a, a DJ's lighting truss or, um, you know, a you know door frame or something like that. So you can really keep it out of the way that way. Can you remote control them? Not at this stage, that one. Um, there are some other lighting um, products on the market that do have remote control. Um, also, the lights that I'm using uh, here are Roto Light Neo 3s. Um, I sometimes bring those to weddings where I do need the remote control aspect as well because uh, I might have to put them in a location where I can't access them. And you can't have them running all the time because it might wreck the ambience of the of the space. And um, I generally only need them during formalities like speeches or first dance. Small Rig does have an app that allows you to um, remote control the, the 120 that, that I'm using. Um, but it's probably the most abysmal app I've ever <laughs> seen. Like Small Rig, what are you doing? Seriously. <laughs> Come yeah. on. Oh, I'll have to yeah. that. It's, it really is. It's absolutely abysmal. And like even... You know, I work with Constant Light all the time, um, uh, particularly with uh, with Loom Cubes um, that I use a lot. And uh, I have to say the Loom Cube app is it's beautiful. It's so easy. You know, it's so easy to it connect straight away. Um, you can have multiple lights connected. You can um, you can control them all individually or together or whatever. I mean, it's just so, so easy. You know, and that's how, that's really how it, so small, like, honestly. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> the lights are very good, do, you know. <laughs> I do also work with, uh, in the commercial space, uh, the Nanlite Forza range of lights, uh, which also have uh, quite a good Bluetooth remote control app. So you can uh, create groups and also scenarios. So you can build, you know, uh, multiple uh, light systems. So if you want like a like a talking head sort of situation, yeah, you can rig up a key light, uh, overhead light, that sort of thing, and and map them out and control each one individually, which is cool. But um, when it comes to uh, flash at weddings, um, I generally have, yeah, on-camera speed light. And if I have a remote control speed light or, um, say, a Godox AD100 in the corner uh, of the reception, I can control power levels at um, camera level um, right on the back of the camera. So... That way I can work uh, on the fly. Um, but yeah, working with uh, video teams a lot, I've found the constant lighting is uh, good to have. And yeah, I just find that balance that suits sort of everyone. Um, and yeah, it's uh, I, I reckon created a really nice dimension to my speech uh, photography. Um, it's very hard to translate a speech in, in a photo sense because it's just someone speaking on a microphone. Um, but I generally look for little reactions and little moments um, between the people that might be speaking and the couple. Um, so I often sometimes even light the the couple sitting down at their table as well. Um, so that way I've got uh, a lot of variety in the final uh, delivery um, of photos as well. And the other thing in terms of lighting, for example, I think that I always think is, is important um, and, and people don't necessarily think about in the very beginning um, is uh, to really to invest into a lighting system that's sort of a you know comprehensive what's the word you know a lighting system literally where you have where you can have multiple lights working together off of the same trigger for example rather than as this, you know so again this is a mistake that I made in the beginning you know I had I think my first flash was uh, a Nikon SB nine hundred or something like that or nine ten or whatever it was um, that was excruciatingly expensive and then when I figured oh uh, I might need a second speed light I went and I bought a cheap whatever it was, Young Nuo or something. Um, but of course, you know, these lights don't really communicate, you know, with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up with three speed lights that were all three different brands um, and, you know, had to manually control. It was pain in the neck, basically. Um, and I think this is the thing to to look out for is that, you know, if you are if you are thinking of investing into lighting, um, you know, go for something that's, that's an integrated system. Like Goldox is a really good brand i think it's very good bang for the buck um this you know this in the beginning there's, there's virtually no need to um i don't know to sell your sell a kidney to buy a profoto rig 
<laughs> you know, or something. Yeah, actually, yeah, absolutely. And um, I have found uh, the Godox, yeah, to like you said, a good bang for your buck, and uh, it has proven itself in the field as being robust enough to work in the professional uh, sense. And that circles back to what we first opened with is uh, investing in yeah good gear to start with is really important if you want longevity out of it because there are going to be times where light's going to um, be knocked over, dropped. Uh, you'll even drop it yourself uh, over time. You know when you're shooting fifty something weddings a year, sometimes back to back. Sometimes you get very relaxed when it comes to handling your equipment and. There might be assistance that you might be working with. You need to make sure that it's robust enough to work in that professional sense and and last the distance. Um, and yeah, have alternatives available in case something does break down at a wedding or leading up to a wedding. Or if you have a back-to-back wedding on a Saturday and a Sunday and something breaks on the Saturday that you've got something available to work with on the Sunday as well. So I actually have a dedicated room in my house that it's pretty much dedicated towards storing gear. Um, it looks like a camera shop down there, but um, I have found over the years that I've needed um, lots of uh, bits and pieces and especially backups. So that way um, I can provide the best quality of service on the day uh, for those couples. Yeah, backups are important. You know, Godox, again, you know, just mentioning Godox. Godox has a great range. Uh, the 8200s are fantastic, fantastic lights. They don't break the bank. Um, you can basically, you usually just pick up a number of those. Um, they're very flexible with lots of different heads that you could use. Uh, you can even, yeah. uh, you get a head where you can clip two together and turn it into, you know, an 8400 effectively, you know, with double the power on it. It's just, just, you know, very, it's a really flexible, flexible system. And sturdy enough, so you can you get a lot of mileage out of those. Um, I recently traveled to Arctic Norway to teach a workshop out there with a whole bunch of uh, Godox gear in my case, and it was fantastic. And we really put this th- we put this stuff through the ringer. Like we were out in, you know, in the Arctic Arctic tundra, um, shooting location shoots left, right, and center. You know, throw this stuff in the back of the van, drive to the next location, get the models out, get the gear out shoot all day and um, you know with the master classes all sorts of different I mean it was I was really very very impressed as to how well that gear um, held up and you know the thing I'm asked a lot is like well what's the point then in like you know spending twice about three times the money on things like Profoto or Broncolor and then I always say you know like if you find yourself at the point in your career where you travel a lot and you hire a lot of gear um, it is a very Worth worth it then to know your way around um, brands like Profoto and Broncolor, mainly because the vast majority, well, virtually all hiring houses around the world will stock these two brands. So no matter whether you, you're flying over to the US or uh, if you're not in the US already, if you're in the US, you're flying over to Europe or you know if you're flying to Africa or Australia, wherever you may be and you don't want to take you know half your house with you in terms of gear, you know, uh, you fly to your place, you hire the gear in, in particular, uh, Profoto and Rock Hollow, two very solid, solid brands that you'll find all over the planet, really. And that's when that becomes very, very, very useful. Um, but if I was today, if I was, if I was to kit my own studio out with new lights, um, I don't really see the the point in spending that amount. Because it's a business at the end of the day. You know, you're going to, like, you know, the money you spend isn't free money. Like, you know, you're going to have to justify that somehow. <laughs> you're going to make that money back. And then, you know, um, so I, f- I found things in, like, in the sort of range of, of the gold oxes in our world. Now that I found them really reliable um, and actually very strong contenders in that, you know, in that sort of um, environment. Also, gold are bringing out a brand new trigger. Wait for that to come. Um, we'll be talking more about this on this show. Uh, in the notch list of years. As soon as I can get my little fingers and hands onto one of them, it's on the way, apparently, they say. Yeah, that yeah. Uh, little trigger has piqued my interest. Um, yeah, I've been working with Godox for years, and um, I do have the um, Expo 2 with the um, Bluetooth transmission in it. I, I do find myself using more of that in the commercial space, but the, um, yeah, the little uh, compact nature of the new one uh, looks good. 
yeah, it does look very good. There's some, some really nice, uh, nice features in there. Um, I like the the idea of a touch screen and um, all that. So it's, it's going to be, yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting little thing. I'll definitely, you know, definitely feature that on the uh, on the camera shake podcast because as I keep threatening on the show, you know, we are actually going to um, uh, we are going to create some more product centric um, bits of content uh, in the not too distant future. So just wait for that. Uh, anyway, okay, so we've we've covered the gear now. If you're out there listening and you think like, okay, well, all right, I've got the camera ready. You know, I can deal with the lenses. That's cool. The lighting. Okay, I got a handle on that. All sounds good. You know, ready to go. But I need some clients. How, especially when you're first starting out, how do you get yourself in front of potential wedding clients? And how do you, but well, let's talk about that first. How do you actually get yourself in front of clients? And then we'll talk about how, how you stand out from the competition, but just purely from a practical point of view, how do you get yourself out there and how do you, how do you land your first wedding client? Yeah, uh, there is a lot of people that have flooded into the market as uh, wedding photographers. And from what I am seeing, they, they go in trying to sell themselves on price, but they really don't have the fundamentals of photography down. Before I started a wedding photography business, uh, I was actually well practiced in photography anyway from a, a hobbyist standpoint where um, I learned all those true fundamentals of photography. You know, I'm a very technical photographer at the end of the day, but um, I learned uh, by making mistakes as a photographer uh, back in the film days and the early days of digital. And um, I just practiced the yeah the pure fundamentals, what lenses do, what apertures do, all that kind of thing. Um, I'm finding a lot of people that uh, love the idea of photography or fall in love with the passion of photography. They think they can start building a business off that. But um, yeah, they are not uh, well-versed in dealing with uh, the situations that you might face at a wedding because... Um, being a wedding photographer, you kind of need to almost understand all aspects of photography. That includes portraiture, photojournalism, architecture to some degree, working in low light conditions, um, and just being an overall sort of people manager as well. And uh, when people go sell themselves on price, um, you're just becoming the same as pretty much everyone else uh, that's out there. Uh, so you need to present a product that's going to stand out and draw in those clients as well. And I feel a great approach for a new photographer getting into this business is creating uh, styled shoots. And they can be as simple as grabbing two friends that are in love and saying, let's go to the beach or to a cliff top or go for a walk in the city streets and create some imagery and uh, that's where you can sort of learn exposing on the fly what apertures do, how to pose people. And once you've learned those sort of fundamentals, uh, repeat and do that to a point where you can be quite confident in directing people because you're going to come across every uh, type of personality uh, out there in the wedding industry. You're going to have people that are really shy in front of a camera and it's your job to extract their personality there are some people that will be just re will almost refuse to be in front of a camera and you have to make them feel comfortable um there are people that uh will pose for you and and be you know ready to go and and look perfect in every frame um but that's not going to be always the case uh, so you have to be very adaptable uh in that sense and then once you've sort of got a folio sort of built in the style shoot arena, that's where you can start maybe offering your services to other wedding photographers where you might uh, say to them, can I come and carry your bag um, for free, you know, just to sort of see how a wedding day works. And um, that can be quite a eye opener for a lot of people. Um, I have mentored a few young people over the years where they have an interest and uh, I say, come and, you know, carry a bag for me one day. And I've done it. Uh, in my past as well, that's uh, a big uh, foundation of how I started was 
you know, carrying bags for other photographers and learning what they did on the job. Uh, take that knowledge and apply it to uh, the stuff that you've learned um, with, the, with the practice shoots. And then you need to get your sort of branding in line, a website built and start building an online presence. And um, once you start going to weddings and maybe the second photography space where you might be shooting for other studios and, and whatnot, starting to build a folio, that's where you st- start to uh, make connections with other suppliers, you know, take photos of those flowers and and maybe the food or details of the dress and, you know, maybe connect to those suppliers and, and just be an overall good human on the day and, and, and be friendly. And um, uh, building a wedding photography business doesn't happen overnight. It took me a number of years. Um, you can do it faster than ever now because there's a lot of training out there for that. Um, but yeah, you have to really look at every aspect of the business, including how to run a business and your branding, your website, your social media, um, connection network, your systems and workflow. And yeah, over time you just have to build that following and, and yeah, find whatever work you can. But I, I found, uh, through network and, and practicing, with um, maybe couples or, yeah, just second shooting for other businesses um, has sort of trained me into what I know today. But that's actually, again, that's really interesting. Um, building a portfolio makes perfect sense. You know, we need to display whatever it is that we're trying to sell. You know, we need to put that in the shop window. You know, of course, we're trying to sell who Yes, then we need to have some hoovers in the shop window. It doesn't make any sense to put, I don't know, cows I don't know why I'm thinking of cows. <laughs> don't put a cow in the shop window if you want to if you want to sell hoovers. What I'm trying to say, yeah, you know. So it makes perfect sense to build a portfolio. Um, but it's again, it's like you mentioned, it's really super important to remember that the wedding industry is exactly that. It's an industry, you know, that consists of a range of different supplies. Everything from the people that make the flowers, um, the venues, um, the food. Um, that even the higher cars, you know, the limos and whatever. I mean, anything and everything that goes into uh, providing a service for that day in photography is one of them. Um, that's really, it's a great networking space um, to get to know people in that space in general, I guess. Yeah, I can tell you that I don't invest a lot of time in social media and there are photographers that live and die by social media and they will get 90% of their business through it. But um, I find I get most of my work, if not all, through network connections and uh, being present on the internet as well um, because investing all your time and energy into social media has a little bit of risk to it because it's not the your part of the internet. It's owned by someone else and they control the viewership and the rules um, around it. And you are at risk of getting hacked and removed. And, you know, there are other people vying for that customer attention. But um, if you have your own website, you can design it the way you want. You can attract the exact people that you want and uh, build a following uh, through that. And getting searchable uh, on the internet is uh, is not as hard as what people think. If you have a valuable content engine that people are looking for, uh, they will find it. And um, another important factor, I think, is, um, yeah, uh, back to the networking thing, is if I meet a limousine driver on the day, I will go up to them and I'll shake their hand and say hello, just be happy and jovial with them, ask how their day has been. Um, Even small talk like the weather just makes everyone feel at ease. And then once we're parting ways, I will say, um, and if the couple's happy with this, I will let them know. I'll send you some uh, photographs of your car and the couple with the car. So that way you've got something for your content and they think that's the most valuable thing in the world. And when they have content on your website, uh, on their website, they will go, oh yeah, I remember that photographer that took that. It was really nice. Um, If a couple asks, uh, about a photographer, I might refer their name, uh, for example. So, um, and I'm, you know, might get work from them. So that means I might refer work back to them as well, and it becomes a bit of a circle. And that's really how it works in the commercial space as well. Is you know, I find that um, I, I get a lot of 
a lot of um, a lot of work through commercial connections that I that I've made over time. You know, in, in my case, I'm very often work I very often work with um, AV teams, so companies that provide audio and video for conferences, for example. Um, you know, and often there's a you know they book a client and there's a need for a photographer, and then you know I tend to well, hopefully my name pops up <laughs> at the top of the list, and then I usually get a call. And that's very often how it works. You know, um, I just actually just um, a week ago or so, I shot a, um, I shot a job um, by the coast, which was um, through a uh, through a video production company that I worked with a lot on on different projects. Um, and it was just uh, the kind of project where they needed they had a client. Uh, they were rebuilding a website. They were actually setting up a business and rebuild and building a website, and they needed um, stills for their website as well as the video that they were. Producing. So it made sense for me to basically be there on that day when they were all together, you know, create uh, create some photography there. It was perfect. But that's again, it's a it's this a business, it's a B two B connection that actually leads to that to that job rather than you know rather than just putting your shekel out the door and hoping that somebody walks by and sees sees oh okay there's you know Kirsten out wedding photography which I don't really shoot a lot of weddings <laughs> at all but you know just as an example. Um, so networking is super important. Uh, do you think is it is it worth um, uh, displaying your work on like uh, wedding fairs, for example? Would you, would you say that's that's a good um, investment generally? Yeah, I I don't um, do the wedding fair sort of thing. That it does happen um, in this uh, city, and also um, because Australia is made up of states, um, it, it does uh, happen uh, across the state as well. Um, I generally find with the customer base that goes there is very price driven. So um, I tend not to be in the sort of cheaper space. So I generally don't go for them and I'm still getting a sufficient amount of work through uh, the referral uh, partners that I have with say uh, celebrants and uh, venues and other photographers as well. Um, I do have sort of a, a regular sort of array of photographers that I might refer work to when I'm not available for that particular date. And that usually comes back full circle uh, as well and has resulted in some great bookings. You've mentioned social media um, mm -hmm. a minute ago. And I know that, that I think it's possibly a misconception, especially among um, people who are just starting out in the photography game generally, but potentially also in the wedding game. Um, is to think that it's all based, it's all driven by social media. And so you, know, you have to have the Instagram accounts and the Facebook pages and all that kind of stuff and you need to invest a lot of time into creating content for it. And I know how time-consuming it is to create social media content. You know, it's it's one of these things. It's um, You can spend a big part of your week just creating social media content, you know, if you're not careful. Um, but in your experience... like. In reality, what percentage of your bookings are actually driven by social media or come through social media in reality? Yeah, when I look at the uh, the metrics of um, the incoming links and stuff like that, it's it's still up there, but it's uh, it's still largely from other suppliers um, because yeah, I, I managed to get myself on a couple of referral lists um, yeah from partner businesses and. Um, and also SEO, um, that's why I kind of more focus on SEO because you generally focus more energy to what is working for you. Um, I just find with social media, um, yeah, there, you know, over the years, even though I had less followers back then, the engagement was a lot higher. So in order to get more reach on social media, you really have to pay for that reach. And when you do pay for that reach, it sometimes it doesn't really gain you any more. So um, I find I just really sporadically post uh, to social media just because I, I do need to keep that going in a way. Um, but they, and at the end of the day, um, yeah, the, the website is where it's at. That's why I invest a lot of time uh, and effort into it. And it's definitely paying off because I'm starting to find that I'm ranking for some uh, really important search terms, um, which uh, I think is driving a lot of traffic to the website. 
such as um, write-ups on venues and um, content articles like um, how many hours do you need a wedding photographer for? And I'm currently ranking between number two and number three um, on Google for that. So um, I know that uh, content style of marketing is, is working for me. And that's I use those articles yeah. as well to help clients. I, and I think that's a super important point. Let's talk about that, actually. Let's just drill down on this. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, you know, I always, personally, I always think of the 80-20 rule. You know, if I can get 80% of the result with 20% of the input, I'm sold. I'll do it. You know, um, I really apply that to just about anything. Anything, you know, even when it comes to like, this podcast, for example, you know, if, if there's a way that I can get to 80% of the, of the result by, by putting in 20% of effort, then I'll do it. And that's, that's good because if you, um, if you apply that, that rule across the board, you're actually going to get much better results on the whole. Um, and that may be, you know, it may be automating certain processes or, or, uh, scaling certain processes down or changing certain processes, whatever it takes, um, you know, for you to get the result, but accumulatively, um, that will lead you to to better results along, you know, further down the road. Basically, that's that's what I've found. So, um, so you mentioned, you know, content driven marketing uh, in order to uh, increase your SEO. What specifically are we talking about? Are we talking about blog posts, for example, or how do you approach that? Yeah, so I have um, blog posts. Um... Uh, on my website, so it's a dedicated sort of page. And I have two main sort of uh, directions where, where I have uh, blog posts. So not only do I have uh, pictures from previous weddings where that might be a blog post that will talk about the day, uh, have some photos of the wedding itself, but I'll put a bit more story, story into it. And that might include things like, um, you know, uh, what's what's a advice you would give other couples, for example? Because I, I send this in the questionnaire and uh, I paste that into the blog posts. So that way it might be a question that might be searchable on the internet. So there might be another couple out there that might be searching for that particular answer and having that content in that blog post might be valuable to them. But also there is... Uh, things like links to the suppliers involved in the wedding as well. So when you have outgoing links on a blog post and, so, you know, of course, incoming links, you become, in the eyes of Google, a more valu valuable resource. So that way uh, you get pushed towards the top of the rankings um, if they've if Google feels that is a helpful article. So... Just by posting a whole bunch of pictures is not going to get you anywhere. But if you have some valuable um, stories or context to either the venue or the approach to that wedding, that becomes more valuable for people to to read. And um, that's how I get eyeballs on those articles. But I also have help articles as well, uh, such as like the one I mentioned before. How many hours do you need a wedding photographer for? Uh, it's quite a long, in-depth article uh, so it's got thousands of words in it but it addresses that important question that when couples are planning a wedding they don't actually know that um, they often sort of see other people getting certain amounts of hours of coverage or photographers offering a certain amount of coverage but um, because weddings are so varied these days they really need to sort of see okay well how many hours do I need for my type of wedding so I've got a few like timeline samples in there, uh, you know, sort of scenarios that might unfold through the day that they need to account for. And also whether if it's a male, female wedding or a same sex wedding, how the approach might be different. Um, and that's based on experience and all those little things, um, become a, a valuable resource to people that might be looking into that. And, uh, that's why I'm ranking quite well in that space and another one that's doing well for me is a uh, a venue guide to a certain region uh, that's near me so we have a winery re region in the uh, in east victoria that um, is a beautiful location probably one of the um, most beautiful wine regions uh, in the world possibly um, and has some award-winning wines that come out of it 
It's a very popular area and I wrote um, an article that um, sort of encompasses all the main uh, venues in that area with photos and samples because I worked in each and every one of them. And uh, that's been a great resource that I've uh, linked out to lots of people in Facebook groups and stuff like that. And that's increased its popularity. And when people search for a particular venue in that area, uh, it's very likely that my article is going to get picked up and shown to them. And that in hope uh, will connect me to new couples that are looking for wedding photography because often the first part of a planning journey is selecting your wedding venue. How consistent are you with the uh, with the content? Like, do you uh, produce new content every week on a weekly basis, or how you know how much new content do you produce? I, don't, I, don't I will know. be very transparent and say it is not consistent at all. It's uh, actually terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but when I do put effort into it, I go to the nth degree in terms of quality of content and make sure it's proofread really well, um, has all the uh, incoming links and outgoing links all mapped out correctly. So that way it's um, yeah engineered in such a way that it's going to be a good read for people and um, that has the right search terms and tags put on it. So um, I do aim to output more during the off season because uh, weddings are very uh, seasonal in my area. So uh, I use the winter to generally um, push out more content. So uh, I generally, yeah, just write a few articles, put them together. I've, I've got an actual big list of things to address. Uh, the next article that I aim to put together is something about how to design uh, wedding suits um, uh, for the guys. So, um, you know, there is uh, a lot of um, unknowns out there for a lot of people and I'm finding um, couples are investing more in the, um, you know, what they're wearing on a wedding day and it's good to maybe link to some suppliers that have come across multiple times and do good work, but um, also just give little um, bits of information such as why do we do certain things like wear a buttonhole flower, for example, Um uh, all that sort of stuff fascinates me and um, yeah, I love to talk about that sort of stuff. And if I can help a, a couple in making the right choices, um, yeah, I've done my job. It's that and wedding dresses, I have to say. It's it's a huge, huge subject. I remember the whole, oh, I, I just, I, you know, my, my old wedding was only well, seven years ago, but I remember it very well. <laughs> the whole, like the year and a half leading up to it, <laughs> you know. Our engagement ring, our engagement rings were a Haribo rings, which we ate eventually. So you know, <laughs> that's cool. I, like that. I can literally say, uh, I like, um, yeah, I like unique uh, things like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, because yeah, the yeah back to that suit article. You know, there there are people getting louder sort of colors and more vibrance uh, with them. So um, yeah, I love to sort of uh, create that uh, almost encouragement or environment where yeah it's good to sort of express yourself as a wedding to make it more yours and rather than the same as everyone else's do you, do you find um do you find, is there a difference in terms of style um between like let's say australian weddings and let's say i don't know like european like maybe british weddings something do, do you can you do you see a difference there yeah um uh because of my Dutch heritage and I've actually photographed a wedding in, in France before the approach is, um, quite different. Um, mostly, you know, how it's structured. Um, when it comes to outfits, I don't think they vary so much. Um, and also styling, um, probably the Europeans probably put a bit more sort of emphasis on the look and the style. Um, uh, in Australia, especially in Melbourne, we're very multicultural and, um, there's a, in Melbourne and Sydney, there's a, a, a very big, um, sort of LG, uh, BTQI sort of community as well. So, um, you will see every, uh, walk of life in terms of how a wedding is structured and, um, how it looks. And, uh, I just recently had a, a wedding on the weekend just passed where, um, two girls, um, had their wedding celebration and one was wearing a pink pantsuit and the other 
a black uh, jumpsuit with bright aqua patterns on it and you know they didn't need to wear big white dresses and it just fitted their personality and it was a fun sort of looking wedding and also feeling wedding at the same time yeah and something that makes for a unique event you know that's the thing if, if every yeah same thing because it was more of them you know they probably would have felt out of place if they actually had the big long gowns or even a white pantsuit for that matter um I think it really sort of suited who they were and it makes it more authentically them. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and the things I I remember, like when, you know, my wife and I, um, when, when we were planning our race, you know, we were thinking about, okay, well, how are we going to, what was it going to be like, you know, on purpose, we came up with a thing that was like totally the opposite of, of who we actually are. But for us, that was amazing because it meant that we could step into a different world for a day, you know, and it was, it was great for that. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty relaxed people just generally, you know, but I went like, I went, okay, I'm going to go for the old out like James Bond suit with the bold tie and that's, you know, and a Kuma band and that's what we're going to do, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I don't think I've, no, I've never won this, <laughs> this way ever, ever again, but it's great, you know, it's great for it. It's almost like a, you know, an opportunity to dress up, I think, you know. Which which we loved it. It was great. Also, our wedding got hijacked a little bit because uh, the thing was, you know, in a in a former life, I used to be a musician. I always say this so it's billions of times on this um, on this podcast. I used to be a musician. I'm obviously still a musician, but you know, I used to be an active professional musician. And uh, I always used to say, like, I've you know, I've played probably I don't know hundreds, if not thousands, of weddings in my lifetime, and I like wedding doubt, you know. Um, <laughs> But the the truth of it actually is, I actually love weddings. I love the whole the procedural thing, and I, I just like it. And it's 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 a it's nice. Yes, it's nice to see people happy and in love, and you know all that kind of stuff. It's it's just uh, it's it's always a privilege to be part of the special day. As a consequence, um, when we were talking about what kind of wedding our wedding was going to be, you know, I was like, well, I don't want it to be like a formal wedding kind of a thing, you know, like with a party and speeches and the whole thing like I, you know I've done this too many times so that's that's just not let's just not invite anybody <laughs> that's not let's not even have a party so I figured you know because um, you know my wife grew up in the UK and so her, her parents now live in the UK but she actually was born in Canada and so she has lots of family she's, she's actually Canadian and she has a lot of family in Canada and it turns out <laughs> I'm sorry it, it turns out that uh, my mom's side of the family were also Canadian um, live about a 45 minute drive away from my wife's relatives, which is given the scale of the country is quite remarkable. Um, sheer coincidence. And so we figured, you know what, what we're going to do is, and of course I have family in Germany too. So we figured like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to have a barbecue over here in the UK with our British relatives. Then we're going to go to Germany. We're going to have a barbecue with my German relatives there. Then we're going to go to Canada. We're going to have a barbecue with our Canadian relatives. And that way, we can involve them all, but we're not in a situation where we'll have to have like one big event and everybody's going to come here and fuck up for flights and hotels and all that, you know. Um, we didn't want to do that to anybody. So that was the plan, right? Um, that plan worked well until all of our British relatives went, oh, party in Germany. Awesome. We're coming. <laughs> and so it was like, what? Okay. And that's actually what happened. So yeah, so uh, we loaded up a plane. I <laughs> got the whole gang to fly over to Germany and then uh, they turned out into a massive oh, it, it just it wasn't even barbecue anymore. It was just getting ridiculous over there. But um but yeah, it was fun. You know, it wasn't it wasn't planned. <laughs> but it was still fun. Yeah, I did have a lot of that um post COVID. Uh there was a lot of uh people getting married overseas or have a symbolic ceremony overseas and they might have a um a party that uh, they might have in Australia because uh, they couldn't get everyone uh, to their weddings. So it's, uh, I even had one couple that did their wedding celebration three times. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, yeah it's, a, it's a fun sort of approach to it, for sure. It's, it, as you mentioned earlier, you know, in Australia, when you guys had, you know, we had, we had a massive uh, time of lockdowns over here, but I know um, Australia opened up way after everybody else. In the, in the rest of the world so it, was, it must have been you know it must have been dragging on terribly for you guys yeah uh and melbourne yeah had the the longest lockdowns in the world um yeah there was nearly two years of closures there so 
it was a very stressful time for the wedding industry, uh, and including myself, um, because yeah, that was pretty much my full-time income. And yeah, I, I was just lucky to have a few clients on payment plans. So that had a little bit of money sort of dripping through. I also set myself up with a little bit of cash before it actually happened as well. So I had a little bit of padding because weddings are so seasonal in, in Melbourne that I need to have a little bit of cash padding through the quiet periods. So, um, and that's something that uh, a lot of younger photographers might need to take on board is uh, cash flow is something that's uh, very important to running uh, a proper business. So if you're constantly throwing money at gear when you're first starting out and not building sort of a financial padding for those quiet periods, um, you're going to get to a point where you're going to be uh, starving, you know, and I learned that a long time ago um, when I first left my uh, previous industry, um, which was um, in automotive electronics and uh, sound equipment. And uh, yeah, it's uh, my first winter was basically scraping together uh, change to uh, feed myself. So, um, uh, of course, uh, I've put things in place uh, as I've become more experienced and, um, you know, uh, a higher sort of earner now. Uh, yeah, it's uh, something to really sort of think about uh, when you're first starting out. I think, you know, uh, taking taking classes in how to run a business is no matter what, I mean, whenever you set yourself up as a business, this is absolutely essential. You know, I've, I've fallen down that trap, you know, uh, in the beginning. Um, and I've learned, I personally have learned the hard way, you know, and, uh, and I think it's absolutely right what you say. It's, it's really important to have some kind of, you know, a little bit of padding just to make sure you can get through the hard times, especially if, if it's seasonal, um, but also, you know, as far as the pandemic is concerned, nobody, nobody could have known that anything like this could actually happen. That's the yeah. same thing when it comes to being a wedding photographer. You really need to be a people person. Uh, I used to come from a sales background, so I have had that ability to be personable with different personality types. And um, yeah, there are some people that photograph weddings uh, that are quite introverted and um, you know not the best conversationalists but um, I find to really shine and um, but not without being over the top as well because sometimes as overbearing photographers the ones that are over exuberant and dancing on tables by the end of the night is sometimes a little bit much it's too much of a show I feel um, part of being a wedding photographer is yeah blending into the crowd but at the same time having that command of you know if you're organizing family photos or group photos or whatever that you can uh get all those people in the line but at the same time you can have just a nice chat to the couple's parents at the end of the night thank them um for uh having me at the end of the night and really leave an impression um that's how you're going to get those referrals um because they remember um you know the experience on the day more so than the photos because it's easy for anyone to achieve good photography now because the gear is getting cheaper and more accessible there is more training available out there but they're still going to refer on someone to maybe photograph a bridesmaid's wedding or a sister's wedding down the track when you left them with a good impression um, on the day itself. And that's, that's really, uh, that is so true. And it's, it's really true in so many different ways. You know, whenever, I think whenever you work with humans, you know, with other people, um, you've got to be a people person. And that's true. You know, if you're doing, if you're doing headshots, portrait photography, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. In the, in the wedding space, um, you are being let into a world that is, um, very personal, uh, for family. You are, uh, getting to know uh, parents of couples and sisters and brothers and their best friends and uh, you get to witness a world that no outsiders often see so um, you just have to be an overall sort of nice person that's uh, empathetic as well and um, being able to recognize uh, maybe the you know the couple might need some space as well because you know they will get to a point that they might be all photoed out and I always encourage people uh, my couples to take five, 10 minutes out of their wedding day to take time alone, reflect on 
you know, their journey up until this point or the words that they shared at the ceremony. And even when I finish their sunset photo session, I'll tell them, you go watch the sunset for another five minutes or look back at your reception and all the people that are here to celebrate your day and I'll walk away and leave them alone. And uh, they find that the most memorable part of their day. Actually, I wrote two, com- two, two conversations that completely fit what you just said. One was with David Berkman where we're talking about photographing um, John Bon Jovi. And, um, and I remember he said, you know, my ability is to know when to be in the room and when not to be in the room. You know, that's like, I'm really good at figuring out when to be there and, and document and take pictures and when to stay the hell away, you know, because otherwise you get into somebody's um, nerves, you know. Um, and it's a very similar thing, a very, very similar conversation I had with Pete Sousa, who used to be uh, Barack Obama's uh, and Ronald Reagan's photographer. And of course, you know, there on the one hand, you've got this this massive um, responsibility of documenting everything that goes on in the White House and around the president. Um, but at the same time, you know, you need to know when to step out, you know, and when not to be there, because there are moments where it's important not to be there. And it's just knowing that, you know, and, and being able to make that connection on a human level, you know, and uh, being able to emphasize with, uh, you know, with other humans is, is super important. It's like you said, you know, in the wedding space, of course, I mean, it's somebody's special day. You don't want to get onto, on, you know, on somebody's day. It's like you said, I, I can imagine that the couple really needs to have these moments to themselves because it is their special day. And yes, you are there to document it, but you know, there needs to be that that little bit of space still. Yeah, and I um, often look to a photographer for support and guidance because they haven't really done this before uh, in the majority of cases. But, um, you know, I'm lucky to have that sort of window where I'm there for the longest period of time out of any other vendor. So I get to see um, every sort of aspect of the day and... Um, yeah, if you can just be a a good calming presence and sort of guide them through um, what needs to happen in terms of timing and uh, getting the best out of them for their photos as well, they're going to really appreciate that. And uh, and you can have whatever sort of gear that you have, but yeah, if you are a strong support for the couple and um, you know. I leave a good impression on the day as well. You, you're just going to get booked. Marcel, as a final tip for for anybody who's thinking about um, getting into into the wedding photography business, do we three things that somebody would need to be able to um, master in order to make it as a wedding photographer? Yeah, um, probably the first thing I'd probably consider is really learn the ins and outs of photography and be well practiced before you practice that on someone's wedding day because it's a an event that can't be repeated. Um, probably the second most valuable thing would be uh, really build your business in such a way, uh, even in the early stages of it, to a point. Uh, to where you want it to be. So that will include things like uh, what gear to purchase, what systems you put in place, and uh, what workflows uh, that you might have uh, as well, uh, right from uh, the capture to delivery uh, of the photos. Uh, Having systems in place will uh, enable you to deliver a good, consistent product. And when you do get busy, that you're across every aspect of that business. Um, as far as a, a final thing, um, I'd probably say um, have every aspect of your business sort of um, has a common sort of voice or um, a common sort of message. So that comes across in your branding, your approach to photography, the way you present yourself on social media, the language that you use in emails, um, working with other vendors on the day, um, communicating with other vendors post wedding when you send their photos. Um, all those little bits and pieces do add up to uh, creating a strong business and um, and charging what you're worth. Um, 
you know, a lot of people go in on selling themselves on price and um, to build their sort of folio. Um, but what that does to them is they pretty much keep themselves in that sort of cheaper zone because it's harder to climb out of that zone in the long run. And you're just going to burn yourself out because if you're trying to fill your calendar with 75 weddings a year at sort of $1,500 a piece, uh, you're going to get to a level where, um, especially when it's seasonal, you're going to be working around the clock to get that workout. And um, my approach to business and uh, a lot of my peers as well is that they'd rather charge more money and work less. You know, the, the old adage of work smarter, not harder <laughs> type of thing. And will enable you to better service your clients and I feel couples will value your service more when you do charge more as well and it's always you know um, the pricing strategy is is super important no matter whether you do headshots or weddings or something like you know whatever it may be um, what you'll find is you know depending on how you adjust your prices you'll at the same time adjust your clientele as well so you know if you're if you're at the lower end of whatever it is that you shoot, you're going to have a particular type of client or you'll attract a particular type of client. But the minute you change your pricing, um, you'll find that the uh, the type of client that you'll attract will change with it. And that's the important part um, to understand. And then also, of course, that has an impact on your marketing because if you're, you know, if you're marketing on people who are willing to spend $10,000 on a wedding, those are different people than the people that, but to spend five hundred dollars on a wedding, you know, it's a completely different, different kettle. Yeah, business. and that's part of uh, creating a sustainable, a sustainable business. Is um, yeah, if you're constantly working yourself to the bone for really not much at all, after you extract your cost of doing business and your taxes uh, on your earnings as well, your actual earnings are quite low and. You're going to get to a point where um, no, I can't do this anymore. So, in order to be sustainable in in this business, yeah, you do need to charge. Um, you know, to adequately not only pay your own way, but of course the government for taxes and the cost of doing business. And when you have to buy new camera bodies every three or four years because they break down, or you know, you invest just you know uh, invest in more and better equipment to make your job easier such as computer systems or or hard drives or whatever um yeah all that stuff takes money and yeah if you're constantly working yourself to the bone for not much at all you can't invest in those tools to make your job easier learn photography learn business and everything else will pretty much fall into place and there's been so much amazing advice in this episode um i think it's, it's very well worth um listening to the whole thing because i you know i've picked up a lot of really really um, amazing gold nuggets in this so uh, myself thank you so much for being on the show today and uh, being a guest on the camera shake podcast um it was great to have you on the show yeah thank you for having me absolutely honored uh, to be part of this and I'm amongst some esteemed uh companies so yeah thank you again okay folks that's it for today it was phenomenal having myself on the show and as always before we go let me just recommend another episode that i think you like Check out episode 148 with Pi Jurser for an in-depth discussion of business essentials for photographers. I'm sure you'll love it. And if you enjoy our content, well, consider supporting us on buymeacoffee.com forward slash camera shake to help us continue creating and bringing you more exciting episodes. Uh, it really does mean the world to us. And for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, did you know that there's a fully fledged video version over on YouTube with plenty of examples of our guest photography in full Technicolor? Well, all you have to do is go over to YouTube, search for Camera Shake Podcast, and you'll be able to watch all past episodes on there. If you're already on YouTube, however, well, drop us a comment, hit the like button, ring that bell, and share with your friends. Your engagement helps us reach a wider audience all over the world. Thank you for listening and watching, and remember, a new episode drops every Thursday, so mark that in your calendars. Till next time, keep shaking things up in the world of photography. See you next Thursday. Bye.